Alex Murdoch's claim is that he ate dinner with his family, took a nap on the couch. He goes to visit his mother, comes home just after 10 p.m. and finds his wife and child shot and killed. Did he murder his wife and son? No. Does he have any idea who did? No. There's no eyewitness. There's no fingerprints. There's no forensics tying him to the crime. None. The defendant is with the two victims at the scene of the double murder. Do you recognize any voices on that video? Paul Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch, and Alec Murdoch. Do you recognize Alec's voice? Yes, sir. This is the same guy who told police he wasn't there. He was taking a nap. Knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. <laughs> what did you do once, once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. Were you, in fact, at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. You continued lying after that night, did you not? Well, once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Last time you saw your, supposedly saw your wife and child, all of this detail, you, you as a lawyer and a prosecutor didn't think that was important to offer on your own? Well, I think it's important. You told this jury how cooperative you were been, you've been and how much information you wanted to provide, but you left out the most important parts, didn't you? I left out, I left out that, I sure did. You don't consider that one of the most important parts? I think it's important. How can you believe them on the ultimate issue when they said they didn't, when the only thing they corroborated for you throughout the investigation, throughout this trial, and throughout Mr. Waters' cross-examination is he's a liar. And that's all you can judge people on. No one who thought they knew this man, no one who thought they were close to this man knew who he really was. And Your Honor, that's chilling. And I've looked in his eyes, and he liked to stare me down as he would walk by me during this trial. And I could see the real Alex Murdoch when he looked at me. Richard Alexander Murdoch, verdict guilty. It doesn't matter how prominent you are. If you do wrong, if you break the law, if you murder, then justice will be done in South Carolina. On the evening of June 7, 2021, Paul, Maggie, and Alec Murdoch were at the kennels on the Moselle property in Islandton, South Carolina. All three family members' voices can be heard on a video that Paul recorded of his friend's dog at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. Moments later, Paul heads over to the feed room connected to the kennels and phone activity shows he was texting. He sends his last text at 8.48 p.m. and his phone locks forever a moment later. At this point, Alec ambushes his son. Paul Murdoch was shot with buckshot from a 12-gauge shotgun in the chest. The shot struck the left side of Paul's chest and exited near his armpit. Amazingly enough, it did not pierce the chest or cause any internal bleeding. He would have survived this injury. This exhibit from the prosecution shows he was standing about five feet into the feed room and the muzzle of the shotgun would have been just past the door frame. The medium velocity blood spatter seen on the floor here is the result of gravity pulling blood down from that wound. This hole in the window shows the trajectory of the buckshot pellets in the feed room. No defensive wounds at all. His hands are down and he takes that shot, buckshot to the chest. And any person who did that would probably think that took care of business because this buckshot, but for some reason he was canned this way and it went through it was a million and one shot, but it didn't kill him. Alec thought it did. But he thinks Paul's shot. And you heard the testimony that Paul appears in the feed room doorway. Is Alex putting down that shotgun to pick up the blackout? And is startled by Paul? That's why the angle's like that. It catches Paul like that and, and goes up into the ceiling. As you've heard the testimony from Kenzie, he blows, blows his brains out. This time it was birdshot from within two feet of Paul. 
The second shot traveled from his shoulder up his neck and out the top of his head, causing immediate catastrophic damage, severing and ejecting his brain from his skull. Paul's face was still intact, suggesting that he was shot while slightly turned toward the shooter. There were blood stains and body tissue on the entry door, threshold, frame, and wall and ceiling above the door, including high velocity blood spatter at the top of the door. Spatter was also identified on the floor and shelf to the right of the doorway. Other evidence at the scene includes hair found on the top of the door and wall, skull fragments on the floor and brain tissue on the outside walkway. There were also defects from the shotgun pellets on the steel door and in the door frame, both at the top and on the right side of the door frame. On the other side of the storage shed at 8.48 p.m., Maggie reads her last text and a moment later at 8.49, her phone locks for the last time. At 8.53, Maggie's phone shows 59 steps traveled. It is believed that after hearing gunfire, Maggie ran from the other side of the storage shed to see what was going on. As Maggie approached the feed room near this overhang area, she would have caught a glimpse of her son, Paul, lying on the concrete in a pool of his own blood with his head half blown off. Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. Probably the last thing on her mind, thinking that it was him who had done this, she's running to her baby. Then she was shot down by her husband with a 300 blackout rifle. Maggie sustained five distinct gunshot wounds from at least four shots. Three of these injuries were non-fatal. The first two shots were parallel to each other, one on her left upper thigh and one on her abdomen that exited around her kidneys. She also sustained a gunshot wound to the wrist. Stippling from around Maggie's wounds indicated that the first two shots had been fired from within three feet. The forensic pathologist testified that the shot fired into Maggie's abdomen while standing would have caused her to bend over or fall to her hands and knees, setting up the first of the two fatal shots. The first fatal injury came from behind, entering first her breast and then her jaw into her brain, immediately killing her. It is believed that the shooter then circled Maggie to deliver the second fatal injury into the crown of her head. Six fired cartridge cases were found in a walking cane handle shaped pattern, indicating that both Maggie and the shooter were moving as each shot was fired. The groundskeeper of the kennels testified that the garden hose was not put up in the way that he did each time and that there was more water pooled in the kennel area than there usually was. It wouldn't take long to strip down and wash yourself off. Get in that cart and head back to the house. From 902 to 906, Ellick's phone indicates he traveled 283 steps, leaving for his mother's house at 907 p.m. Far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? Going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jog in place? No, nope, I didn't jog in place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. One moment later, data from Alex's vehicle recorded him passing the exact location on Moselle Road where Maggie's phone would be found in the shrubbery the following day. His vehicle recorded him speeding up after passing this location and maintaining a high rate of speed until he reaches Almeida. At 10.05 and 57 seconds, Alex Suburban arrived back at the kennels and he calls 911 about 20 seconds later at 10.06 p.m. Alex told investigators he came home and found him. Central 717 seen his secure. Got a whiskey fox, whiskey mic, both gunshot wounds to the head. Sir, I want to let you know because of the scene, I did, I did go get a gun okay. and bring okay. it down here. It's in your vehicle? Do you leave, have any guns on you at all? Leave, no, sir. It's leaning okay. up against the side of my car. Okay. You're, you're fine, man. You're fine. Turn around for me. I don't have any. Okay. Yes, sir. I see that. Okay. This is your wife and son. <laughs> okay. How did you pull up? You from back there? I went to the house and they weren't home, which was odd. I tried to call. Okay. And then I knew they had been down here before I left to go to my mom. Okay. I pulled up and I could see them, and 
you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my, my boy over there, I could see it was... <laughs> I could see his brain on... <clears throat> and I ran over to Maggie and... <laughs> Uh, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I... I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Neither of the murder weapons were ever found, though prosecutors believe that both are family weapons as it was determined that matching case cartridges were found in other parts of the Moselle property. But we know, unlike the expert they call from Connecticut, where they can't even get ARs, who doesn't know about people riding around on property, doesn't know about Paul and the two guns he likes to use, he doesn't know about this family and how common those guns are together, says, well, his only conclusion is, oh, it would be practical for somebody just to, to, to fire out the clip. But this is him, this is Alec prosecutor, the lawyer, and he's thinking through this. He's thought through this. He's going to use two guns because it's going to confuse people that perhaps there were two shooters. But again, it doesn't make sense. Two family weapons? Indicators of gunshot residue were found on Alex's hands, shirt, and his shorts. His shoes did not test positive for gunshot residue. The forensic examiner testified that the white t-shirt and shorts were in the vicinity of a gun being fired or the residue transferred from a surface that had gunshot residue. And to be fair, he did retrieve a weapon from the house after apparently discovering the bodies, so it could have transferred from that weapon. It was also revealed that after the roadside shooting incident in September of 2021, that Alex's seatbelt in his Suburban had gunshot residue on it, though a time frame for when that particle of residue was placed there could not be established. But the most significant piece of evidence when it comes to gunshot residue is this blue jacket that the defense fought hard to get excluded from evidence. It was recovered in October of 2021 from the home of Alex's mother. The forensic scientist testified that a significant number of particles of gunshot residue were found on the jacket. More particles were found inside the hood than the outside. The expert testified that the jacket could have been worn inside out or, and as the prosecution theorized, a recently fired firearm could have been wrapped inside the jacket. Additional key evidence was recovered from Paul's phone, which was a video recorded on Snapchat earlier in the evening before the shootings, which showed Alec in a blue collared shirt and long khaki pants, showing that he did change his clothes. The Murdoch family housekeeper testified she remembered Alec having this shirt on that day because she specifically remembered helping him fix his collar. This shirt was never recovered and Blanca, the housekeeper, testified that she never saw that shirt again and she was the one who handled all the family's clothes, laundry, etc. Additionally, Shelly Smith, the caretaker at his mother's house that night, testified that he was wearing the white t-shirt and shorts when he came to visit, but that he had Sperry topsider shoes on and not the GSR-free sneakers he was wearing when police arrived. Any shoes that were canvas-type shoes? The boat shoes, like the Sperry? Sperry shoes? Yes, sir. And do you remember those? Yes, sir. They used, they used to sit in the closet. They used to sit in the closet. Mm -hmm. After June 7th of 2021, did you ever see the Sperry boat shoes again? No, sir. I do not recall seeing them in the closet. Never, ever? No, sir. Shelley testified that Alec had also asked her in kind of a roundabout way to lie about the amount of time he was at Almeida that night, suggesting to her it was more like 40 minutes rather than the 20 minutes that she remembers and that data from his vehicle and his phone corroborates. What was he telling you about that he was at the house the night of the murder? 
that he'd been there 30 to 40 minutes. Did he indicate to you what he wanted you to do with that information? No. Mm -mm. No. no. What did he say? He just said that he was at the house for 30 to 40 minutes, I said. Was he there 30 or 40 minutes that night? Not to my recall. Why are you crying, Mr. Smith? A good, fam a good family, and I love working here. And I'm sorry all this happened. They're good people, you know. He wasn't there no 30 or 40 minutes, was he? No. no. Get back. Get back. two more that don't get to testify. We couldn't bring you any eyewitnesses because they were murdered. But common sense and human nature can speak on behalf of Maggie and Paul. When you look at this in its totality, common sense and human nature can speak for them. And they deserve a voice. Everything he did was to meant to try to frustrate the forensics as a lawyer and a prosecutor with the two guns and the manufactured alibi and not taking his phone down to the scene, deleting call logs, making short phone calls, bringing up the boat case, moving Maggie's phone, changing clothes, looking at Paul's phone, calling Rogan, or trying to call Rogan. One man controlled this crime scene initially and that was out. But there were some things he couldn't control. And we brought those to you.